Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to your church. <laughs> Hope you like it here. I'm with my wife of 28 years. Uh, her name is Fatima, and uh, it's uh, uh, for the first two days that I was here, I was a bit lonely because I, I wasn't, well, she wasn't with me, but thank God yesterday she landed uh, on your really large airport. <laughs> I'm speaking about the mountains, though, no? <laughs> and uh, it was really, I'm so really happy to have her here uh, with me this weekend in this amazing place, Terrace, BC. You, you, you bring me to uh, wonderful places. <laughs> and so when your wife read about uh, Psalm 8, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And in the prayer, is like, uh, yeah, what's good here? Like, uh, it's all flat. <laughs> but here we see the mountains and... Uh, and Joe and I posted on FB the salmon catch we had, and all the Manitobans were drooling when they saw that. <laughs> it went viral. And so to us, pickerel is the main fish to fish. But uh, I said, the salmon here, they are jumping out of the water into the boat. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, we're so blessed, and we are so thankful to be invited here. And uh, Joe, he has been inviting me and my wife and family for 22 years <laughs> to come up here. And I think this is the perfect timing, perfect timing to be here. And so, yeah, thanks for inviting us and uh, thanks for coming out this morning. I know you have a lovely summer and you chose to be in church. Man, God has something for you and me. And so that's what we have been praying. We prayed a while ago that God's agenda... It's to bring transformative work in each and every one of us, okay? I'm preaching from uh, our series for the summer entitled Conversations. It's a, uh, it's a series on the conversations of Jesus with different people in the Gospels. But John Maxwell said that we grow into the conversations around us. And so it's very, very important that we are careful in who, who we converse with and what kind of conversations do we hear around us. And so studying on the conversation of Jesus with different people in the, in the gospel is critical, I believe, into growing us into men and women who are intimate with Jesus Christ. And that we grow out of this conversations that, of, of people around us as well. The intimacy of men and women around us so that you and I can become like more of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Discipleship is, yes, fellowship. But at the same time, becoming like him. Becoming like him in character and at the same time, becoming like him in his mission. We're not just to be blessed. We are to be blessings. We are to be conduits to the world around us. And the world around us, they don't need religion. They need the relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, we, they don't need to hear that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to see and sense that relationship coursing through us. They need to know that relationship is our very purpose and essence in life. And so that's why I came up with this uh, series entitled Conversations. And the title of my message this morning is Knowing Jesus' Greatness in the Time of Trouble. I don't know about you, but as a Filipino, I love basketball. And even though we are vertically challenged, we feel like we're seven-footers <laughs> when we are on the basketball court, right? And I know you guys love hockey, uh, but we love basketball in the same way you guys love hockey. And if you go to the Philippines, you will see basketball courts everywhere, a hoop connected to a coconut tree that grows every year. And so you have to bring it down the next year to the height of 10 feet. There's just basketball courts everywhere. And so I was given the opportunity on the last year of my favorite basketball player, Kobe Bryant, to watch him in the Staples area, a Staples Center in L.A. A pastor in L.A. gave me and my son free tickets in the Staples Center to watch Kobe Bryant. And he was playing against one of my favorites, being a Christian, Jeremy Lin, this Taiwanese uh, Christian who became an NBA sensation entitled Lin Sanity. And so, like, I was given this, I hope it was front row, but it was probably 150 rows 
but at least I was there and I saw Kobe Bryant this high, this 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 high this 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 short and and I was like going crazy like watching this guy that I have watched and and uh, you know just admire admired throughout the years and to be there on his last year and even playing playing against Jerry Millet just seeing live in person the, my favorite basketball team and my favorite basketball player now to me as a christian that is you know my intimacy with jesus christ nothing comes close to that to have a front row seat of seeing Jesus' greatness, Jesus, you know, Jesus' love and, and kindness and compassion and purpose, to know him and to see him at work, nothing comes close. Not even a front row seat watching my favorite basketball player. Because as a Christian, when I got, when I got saved, this, this unbelievable emotion of having been connected to God through Jesus Christ just exploded from the inside of me. And it transformed me from the inside out. And I've been a Christian now for 34 years. And not even money, not even fame, not even fortune, not even any pleasure in the world can come close to that. Because that is the greatest joy a human soul can ever have. To know Jesus in a very intimate and personal way. And that was just the beginning. We have a lifetime and an eternity to have a front row seat of knowing Jesus. And we love to pray, Lord, I want to know you more. I need you, Lord. Just a while ago, I heard that prayer, Lord, we need you. And I pray a lot that, I, Lord, I want to know you. We, we speak of Philippians chapter 3, right? I want to know you more and the power of your resurrection. But we stop there. That's the problem. Because what follows is, and also the fellowship of your sufferings. In 1st June chapter 5, there's no such thing as fellowship of the sufferings. It's just, Lord, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection, period. But you know, that's a sin to subtract from Scripture, right? And so, but most of us, we kind of like cherry pick, right? You, we just choose what we want. Oh, I want to know you more. I, I want to, I long for your presence. We need you, Jesus. But let me tell you, in my study of scriptures and in my lifetime experience, to know the Lord, it comes with some sufferings to introduce me to him. Oh, it's quiet. (laughs) We don't want sufferings. We don't want adversities. We don't want persecutions. We don't want hardships, but we want to get to know Jesus. But you know what? I believe with all of my heart, as I, in my study of Scripture, is that sufferings is a prerequisite for me to be able to connect to a spiritual Jesus. Because I live in the world that is what you call a physical realm, controlled and dominated by the five senses. But Jesus is not in this realm. He is in the spiritual realm. And for the most part, in order for us to be able to really become intimate with Him, of course, with our prayer time, that's, that's important, with our Bible studies. But there are many times that we've been reading the Bible and you look at the Scriptures and, you, and it looks like it's German when you're a Filipino. <laughs> or like it's in French when you are English speaking. You know what I'm talking about. We're just, we're just going through the motion and we're not getting anything out of it. Because I believe for the most part in our journey, suffering, troubles are required in order to bring about the possibility and the opportunity to see God's greatness. To see Jesus in motion, in action, evidenced, you know what, in the midst of this trouble that we are faced with, that he comes and reveals himself. Greater than anything that the world and the spiritual realm against us and against him can throw against us. And he, we will see the greatness of God. We will see, we will grow in our knowledge of the Lord. And so my scripture this morning is found in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 36. You guys love scripture here? Yes. More than books? Yes. More than John Maxwell? Yes. And you say, who's John Maxwell? Scripture, man, this is, this is definitely, 
uh, you know what, 99.9% that God will speak to us. Scripture is very, very, of course there's prophecy, of course there's pastor speaking, but you know what, the Scripture, let me say 100%, 100%, 100%, this should be the basis and the source of our hearing from God. Scriptures. In, uh, yeah, I grow in, 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 in intimacy when it comes to my relationship with God through scriptures and prayer and worship and Bible study. But, you know, adversity and troubles have a way of really making him, you know, uh, become more non- uh, known and, and revealed into our lives. And so let's read in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 36. And let's start with the immediately, that word, take note of that. Immediately after this, this meant that it was after the feeding of the 5,000 men. Immediately after feeding 5,000 men and probably 5,000 women and more kids. Okay, because how did you know that there were kids? Well, you know, Jesus needed a boy or the boy's lunch in order so that he can pray and multiply the five loaves and two fish. So there were probably classmates there and friends who went with them, who went with him. And so there's probably around at least 15,000 people. Jesus miraculously fed. And we love miracles like this, right? Yeah, we're all praying for miracles. And so afterwards, immediately after this, Jesus insisted. Take note of the word insisted. In some other translations, compelled, commanded. This was not a simple instruction. Like, oh, hey, Matthias, go get the, the, the tomato at the backyard. It's not like that. It's like, it's like mentioning the whole name. Matthias Dominguez. Please go get tomatoes now. Something like that, right? And so Jesus insisted, compelled, commanded the disciples, and I'll, I'll explain to you later why. Jesus insisted that his, his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. And while he sent the, while he sent the people, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. You know, there's this North American misconception amongst Christians that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it's going to be smooth sailing. Everything's going to go well. You're going to be blessed. If you own a one-acre property in Terrace, because now you're in Jesus, you will have a 1,000-acre property in Terrace. You're going to prosper. And all kinds of those kinds of promises even coming from preachers. And yet when I read scriptures, there were 11 martyrs amongst the 12 who died a martyr's death. And they speak of sufferings and persecutions. The resume of Paul wasn't that of a Fortune 500 CEO that has a cabin that's worth $5,000 by the side of the mountain, by the lake. Well, Paul said, you know, this is my resume as an apostle of Jesus Christ. I was, you know, um, I was uh, whipped with the 39 lashes twice. And I was, uh, you know, beaten and uh, uh, stones were thrown at me. I I, I had forced fastings. I was in prison and so on and so forth. And he said, that's me, the apostle of Jesus Christ. That's me, the follower of Jesus Christ. And so they obeyed Jesus. They followed Jesus. And then in the middle of the journey, something happened. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. Take note, far away from land. Not cruising on the coast. Not being part of a cruise along the coast. They were far from land. For a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them. Walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. Aside from the fact that it was windy, it was dark, it was the waves were high. You know what? Who walks on water at three in the morning? Well, we can do that in Winnipeg in minus 40. I can even do the moonwalk on frozen water. And so they didn't recognize Jesus. And they thought that he he was a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Take note of this calm demeanor and words coming out of his mouth. In the midst of the storm, 
a calm, assuring voice. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. That's when he had the emphasis that don't be afraid. It's me, and I am here. I want you to know this. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of this perilous journey, I am here. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Then, then Peter, oh, called to him of, of all the disciples. Peter is always the one pushing the envelope. Yeah. Always blurting impulse, impulses. Very impulsive. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yes, come. So, the, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. And after they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area. And soon people were bringing older sick to be healed. And they begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe. And all who touched him were healed. And so again, uh, many of us believe in the Christendom that if we are at the center of the will of God, circumstances will be good and the journey will be smooth sailing. And I say with scriptures backing me up, that is wrong. In fact, the opposite is true. The only difference we have with people in the world is that we are going in the direction of God's will and we have Him in the journey. If you are not in Christ, then it's, it's hell on earth. Right? And you don't have a Savior to help you, to save you, to, to protect you, to guide you. And so as Christ's followers, even if we are in the center of God's will, then we will experience troubles along the way. We will face adversities and difficult circumstances. You know, the disciples, they were not just in trouble, they were fighting for dear life. And we're talking about professional fishermen among them who are... Um, you know what, experience when it comes to dealing with the uh, storms and, 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 and difficult situations while they're fishing. And yet they were fighting against strong wind and heavy rains. And so in this moment of trouble, this should teach us lessons of faith that will enable us not just to survive, but to thrive in the midst of the storms of our faith life. You know, in, in, in a couple of months ago in my devotions, I read a lot of w the word suffering, suffering, sufferings. And before that, you know, if I see a word sufferings, I, 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 I just uh, pass over it. <laughs> I don't want to read that. I don't want to study anything about sufferings. But because of our journey, of which we will be sharing and talking about tonight, that we have discovered that there's just so many troubles along the way in but God's agenda in the midst of those troubles is not just to survive, but to thrive and to grow in our knowledge and our intimacy with Him. And so now, you know, I have a different perspective when it comes to sufferings. It's a different mentality now. And, uh, and, and, and I will explain why. And so from here, I had three points. I, I, I'm being a good Pentecostal and uh, at the same time... Uh, you know, uh, I've learned from the Baptist, there has to be at least three points. <laughs> but I'll be talking about the Spirit and three points. That's better than just three points and the Holy Spirit. Oh, at least you have both, both sides, right? The best of both worlds, Bapticostal theology. <laughs> three points and the Holy Spirit. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. So number one lesson we can learn from this story is that we should obey God no matter what. Just obey God. Christianity is not about just, you know, getting saved and going to heaven. If that would be the case, all of you would stay in, a bap in the baptistry for 10 minutes until the bubbles stop going up, stop coming up. You know, when the pastor baptizes you, you're just to be saved and go to heaven. And everybody that will be baptized will stop breathing after. <laughs> no, that's not the case. We got saved, right? And we're still alive. I got saved 34 years ago and I'm still alive. 
So because God is calling me to a lifetime of obeying, of following, of being a disciple. For some of you probably you think, oh, if I'm just going to go to hell, I'm not going to be saved through Jesus Christ. And then the moment we, have, we pray the quote-unquote sinner's prayer, then we gave up the ghost, the King James said, right? We're done. But that's not the case because we try to think of having a relationship with Jesus Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior is just a ticket to salvation, ticket to heaven. Yeah, that's true, but that's not the whole truth. God is calling us to a lifetime of obedience and following and serving. And so if you're not serving, if you're not following, you have a different set of troubles. Those are, this is uh, what you call more of a discipline troubles, <laughs> right? Because God wants you to obey. God wants you to follow. God wants you to enjoy the adventure that he has in store for you, okay? But you know what? If you are following Jesus, then why? That's good. That's the life that we ought to be living. And along the way, there may be troubles. There may be trials and hardships that are so difficult to face and even overcome, in this manner, in this matter, you know what? They didn't know what's going to happen in the middle of the lake, but they obeyed. Another thing is that the word immediately. Why is that important? And then the word Jesus insisted, compelled, and commanded them. Because after Jesus fed 5,000 men miraculously, there was a clamor to make Jesus king. Imagine having a king that can feed you miraculously every day. From five pandisal, or five loaves, or whatever bread you guys eat here. We, uh, we Filipinos, we, we love pandisal. Okay? You just bring to church and say, Pastor Rob, we got two loaves of bread and uh, two, two small salmon. That's all that we got. Can you please pray? Or imagine if you're trying to uh, interview pastors. You're looking for a new pastor. Well, show to us that you're really spirit-filled. We got five loaves of bread and two fish. Multiply that and we'll make you senior pastor. With a parsonage on the side of a mountain by the lake. Be our king. Amen? You know, if the, if the people of Terrace would hear about that, they, he will not just be senior pastor. He will be mayor. And if the whole of the province of uh, 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 B.C. hears about that, he will be premier. And if the whole of the country of Canada hears about that, he will be prime minister. <laughs> well, he's not applying to be prime minister. <laughs> He'll stay put here, right, Rob? Yeah. And so Jesus, there was a clamor for Jesus to become king. And the disciples, that is a very interesting proposition. Because they all wanted Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom. And they're the knights of the round table. Rectangular or square, it doesn't matter. They're going to be elevated to a very lofty position. King Jesus is king of Israel. And we are his men. The inner circle. And so they were hearing this clamor. And Jesus didn't want them to hear more about it. And so, therefore, Jesus immediately insisted, right about, you're going to cross to the other side. Obedience, we obey no matter what the circumstances are along the way. And also, no matter what the circumstances are, as far as what we're leaving behind. You know, there might be a, pro a promotion to become a CEO of a company or a business opportunity. Or it may be a negative circumstance or a difficult situation. Some of us, oh, I would love to move somewhere else because of a difficult circumstance. circumstance. We are very circumstantial decision makers. Very emotional, very impulsive. But as a Christian, we should not be driven by circumstances in our situation or circumstances along the way and say, hey, we quit. I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. I don't want to fight, for, fight against strong winds and waves. No, it's all about obedience. Right? We were a bunch of rebels, disobedient, disobedient men and women. And the moment we got converted, you know what happens? We cry, Abba, Father. And also there's this conviction that we should be good kids obedient kids following jesus every step of the way and so the disciples obeyed the lord jesus christ no matter what was ha going to happen along the way 
because they knew that there are some, some surprises along the way. And then at the same time, even though there was a very, very interesting proposition after Jesus fed 5,000 men, nevertheless, these men obeyed. You know what? Obedience or application of God's word is king. There's a, there's a, pro, a parable in the, in the book of Matthew chapter 7. It's a parable of the good and the bad foundations. Both listeners, the, both were listeners, both men were listeners, and yet the one who obeyed or applied the teaching was the one likened into a house founded on rock, on a bedrock. And so when the strong wind came and the flood came, it stood the elements. It stood the test of the elements of nature, the violent elements of nature. But the other one listened to the teaching, listened to the words of God, and yet did not, did not apply or obey the word of God. And so when the flood came and the winds blew upon the house, great was its fall. And so when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, obedience is something that should be just the norm. Our life is all about seeking the will of God, knowing the will of God, and then immediately obeying the will of God. You know, the, the patriarchs in the Bible, they didn't wait for so long. When, when God spoke to Abraham, the former idolatrous person, he heard the voice of God and his spirit responded and said, that's the real God. And God said, you know, I'm going to bless you. You have to leave your place. You have to leave all of your relatives and go to a place I'm going to show you. There, were no, uh, there, were no, um, there was no address yet. Just ride the plane and uh, go wherever it lands. Just go. In verse 4 in Genesis chapter 12, the Bible said he left after that. When he was commanded to offer his son Isaac, he didn't wait for the noontime. He didn't wait for the afternoon. He didn't wait or excuse himself because I have overtime. I have work. Uh, oh, so many sick people in the hospital. So, yeah, I just uh, opted to get more four hours of uh, overtime. No, and the next day, early morning, he left with his servant and his son, Isaac. Stories of men and women who obeyed and discovered the goodness of God and discovered who God is in their lives. And so, my friends, let me encourage you. Live a life of obedience to God and His words, no matter what. Your circumstances where you're at and your circumstances along the way. Because that is supposed to be our life. A life of walking hand in hand with Jesus. Amen? And you might be wondering, like, what will happen to us, you know, financially speaking? Well, don't worry if you give up your business God owns the, uh, the million upon millions of stars in the universe. God owns all of the salmon in the Pacific. God owns all of the lobsters in the Atlantic. God owns all, all the cattle on a million hills or a thousand hills. God owns everything. Just don't worry. In fact, you will be in for an adventure of discovering the greatness, the goodness, and the riches of God. Just obey. Amen? Amen. Say to the neighbor beside you, this message is good. This is for you. <laughs> Better listen. Amen? Yeah. That's a way of saying uh, it's not for me. This is for you. <laughs> Second, God is greater than the perilous journey. Let me read the scripture. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when they climbed, cl climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And after they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. Now, the disciples, the, they, were, they, were, they were told to cross to the other side of the lake. Now, uh, there's a possibility that either by Christ's divinity or word of knowledge that he knew that there was going to be trouble in the middle of the lake, right? Nevertheless, he told the disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Second, Jesus is the word of God. You know, everything was created just merely God speaking things into existence. You know, imagine he created the whole universe just by saying, let there be light. And what kind of lights were created or light was created? 
It's like uh, in a galaxy like ours, there is actually r- around 100 million to a billion stars or suns in the Milky Way. And there's like around probably a million, um, 100 million galaxies all over the, the universe. And so there's like, I heard somebody said there's like um, two, 21 sextillion stars in the universe. You know that there is, our, our sun is a small star. You know that there are stars as big as the orbit of Neptune around the sun? The orbit. It's really a big star. And yet God just spoke it into existence. Let there be light. And all of a sudden, immediately, these suns came into being. These stars came into being. Planets came to existence. Are, Are you getting the picture? Whatever God says, it will surely come to pass. And so when Jesus said, we're going to cross to the other side, I am going to show to you who is Lord of all. Even if you're going to be facing, in fact, you're going to be facing trouble in the the middle of the lake. But I will show you that I trump all troubles and all oppositions and all obstacles because I am Lord of all. That's why it's fun to obey the Lord. You know, uh, you know I'm, I'm excited when I hear God give me an instruction or, or a command, or even though it's against my, my human logic. I knew it, if I know it's from the Lord, backed up by the Scripture, that it's grounded in, 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 in the principles of Scripture, then I will obey. We will obey. Because you know what? We, it's an opportunity, even if there's like storms and trials and troubles and persecution, it's an opportunity to see the greatness of God. You'll have front row seat seeing how great your God is going to be. Because he will show himself greater than all the obstacles and all the trials and all the persecutions. You know, as, as Christ followers, you know, there are times that we are up against desperate struggle. With ourselves, with our circumstances, with our, with our temptations, with our sorrows, and with our decisions. For the most part, we feel that the wind is against us. It's often contrary. We're swimming upstream all of the time. Now, if you're trying to do things in your own strength, that's the old covenant. You know, the old covenant's all about self-reliance, self-righteousness. And then when you become, you know, like you're able to do 9 out of 10, you brag about it and you become more prideful. If you do less of the Ten Commandments, then you become more guilty because you feel like you're wicked. That's the old covenant. You know the new covenant is not about our strength. You know the new covenant is all about us discovering how weak we are so that we rely on the grace and the power of God. That's how the new covenant power and grace is released or unleashed into our spirits and into our situations and into our circumstances. We need to grow in knowing first how weak we are so that we can actually discover how great God is. That's why the Apostle Paul said when he had a thorn in the flesh, we don't really know what the thorn in the flesh is. He was so, he was so in pain and he was so much in great struggle that he prayed that prayer, Lord, take this thorn in the flesh thrice. In the Hebrew or in the Hebrew culture, in the Jewish culture, when you say, you know, he prayed thrice. He prayed with so much intensity, with all of his heart, with all of his being, similar to Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. The same statement. He prayed, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh. And after he prayed that prayer, God did not remove the thorn in the flesh, but he had a greater revelation. A greater revelation that when he is weak, the strength of God is made perfected in his weakness. And therefore, Paul said, I glory. You know the word glory is that when you win your hockey game against the other team that you really love to beat. Or against the basketball team that you really love to beat. Or probably just a simple board game in the family. And your sibling, ah, you're going to eat dust. I want you to lose. That word glory means like, yeah, hey, I won. Yeah, hey. So Paul was saying like, oh, some Canadians are hoping to win the lottery and do the happy dance. Right? The 30 million jackpot. And so Paul was saying, I glory, I rejoice. I'm jumping up and down and doing the happy dance when I am weak. 
when I'm first with, uh, faced with persecutions and hardships and trials. Because when, when, when I am weak, then his strength is going to made per, be made perfected in me. I'm going to see the greatness of God. And so sufferings, hardships, troubles are simply opportunities for us to grow in the new covenant, in the grace covenant, and to see the greatness of God as we see our weakness and limitations. Because when we're at the ends of our rope, that is when God's greatness begins. That's when we begin to see the greatness of what Jesus did on the cross, His resurrection. And that's why Paul said that I may know Him. And the power of his resurrection. And the part that we don't want. The fellowship with his sufferings. We don't want fellowship with sufferings. Is there anybody here who went to, who went to Tim, Tim Hortons and sat there? Hey, suffering, can I fellowship with you over a coffee? <laughs> I love to fellowship with sufferings. No, we love to fellowship with health. We love to fellowship with prosperity, promotion. We love to fellowship with comfort and convenience. Hello? But fellowshipping with sufferings? I don't think so. But let me tell you, if you're growing in, the, in this new covenant relationship with God, if you're growing in this New Testament relationship with God, my friend, suffering doesn't bother you. What bothers you is sin. What bothers you is the, the things that hinder you from having an intimate connection with God. And so God allows sufferings and trials and hardships to deal with sin. And at the same time, to enable us to lean on him. Remember what the song says? Leaning. That was a long leaning. I, I already said leaning and then you were still singing leaning. Oh my goodness. That's a, that's a, a 30 by 60. I'm a, I was a civil engineer. Right? Because I didn't know the song. It was first time to hear it. And it was really a long leaning. Uh, I, I really felt the leaning on Jesus there. <laughs> Amen. You guys got an amazing praise and worship team. Why don't we give them a round of applause, right? Shout out to you. Amazing, amazing. And so, my friends, when we are faced with trials and troubles, don't quit. Don't complain. Don't run away. You're in for a front row seat of seeing the greatness of God. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus calmed the water and the storm, he was in the boat. Remember this. After the experience of the miraculous, you know what they said? They questioned, who is this man that even the winds and the wave obey? They, they were asking, like, who is this man? But in Matthew chapter 14, what did they say? They exclaimed, truly. You are the son of God. In the first encounter with Jesus in the, in the midst of the storm, it was like, who are you? After some time, conviction solidified. Knowledge of God solidified. You are truly the son of God. In both instances, it required a storm to ask, who are you? And in the second one, to get to know him further. Amen. So now, you know, I, I don't encourage you, Lord, yes, give me sufferings. <laughs> let it come, Lord, let it come. We don't have to pray, it's going to come. <laughs> like we're in the middle of summer and like, uh, Lord, please send the snow. <laughs> Lord, please send the minus 40 that comes from Winnipeg. <laughs> well, you know, you, you don't have to pray, let the snow come. It's going to come. Winter's going to come. And so for Christians, you don't even have to pray, yeah, I like suffering. No, it's going to come. You don't even have to pray. And every time you pray, Lord, I want to know you more. Ah, Lord, I need you. I long for you. Yes, I'll send you sufferings. Send you trouble so that you can see my greatness and get to know me more. And when you read the Bible and you pray, you sense him more. Amen? When everything is okay and good and you're getting promoted, you read 50 chapters and you don't get anything out of it, right? You felt like, yeah, there's nothing. Amen. It's all German. Guten Morgen. <laughs> Guten Abend. I speak low German. You might be wondering, are you German? No, I'm Filipino. But Filipinos can only speak low German if ever we speak. Why? Because we're short. 
So pardon my sense of humor. <laughs> and so you're reading the Bible, everything is fine and well, and you're, everything is okay, and you're praying, and you, you don't sense Jesus that much, right? But when you're in the thick of things, when it comes to tr- facing troubles and trials, my friend, just one verse, ah, Jesus, that's you, Lord. Amen? You pray for one minute and you feel like the presence of God because you pray with all of your, Lord, I need you, help me. And he'll be there. Immediately, he will stretch forth his hand and reach out to you. A lot of us, we are being dragged to trials and following Jesus, kicking and screaming. We even sometimes, if not most of the time, resist and resent. That's the... Most of the Christians are in our resist and resent. It's not relaxation and rest. It's resist. I don't want to obey the Lord. You know, especially when my, my wife and I heard that God was sending us to Winnipeg. I didn't know where, we don't know where Winnipeg was. Because we, we Filipinos, we only know the United States of America. And of course, Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Como Sava? Sava bien. And so Winnipeg, so there was no Google back then yet. So that was in 1997. There's no Google. And so we just asked, and they said, that, said it's the prairies, and it's famous for Winnie the Pooh. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Winnie the Pooh was discovered in Winnipeg. Really? And we love Disney characters. And what else is famous? What, is, what else is Winnipeg famous for? Uh, minus 40. Did, can you say it again? Minus 40. Some, What's minus 40? Uh, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Everything freezes. When you spit, it freezes in the air. When you cry, it's, it, it freezes. And when you stay there longer, you freeze. And so uh, friends of mine, Caucasian friends of mine, uh, keep asking, why Winnipeg? Why not Hawaii? Well, I tried praying for Hawaii. Lord, send me to Hawaii. Send us to Hawaii, Lord. Oh, wow. <laughs> and but the Lord didn't say yes. And so Winnipeg. And you know what? Winnipeg can be a paradise if that's God's perfect will. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hawaii will be hell if that's not God's perfect will. Yeah. Amen. Somebody said, we'll not go to Hawaii anymore. It's hell. <laughs> the pastor said it's hell. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying wherever you're at, in the will of God, it may be the worst place in the world, but God can make it a paradise. Spiritually speaking, it doesn't mean that when you go to Winnipeg, it will, start, it will stop snowing, and the temperature in winter will just be minus two. No, it's still the same thing, but on the inside, you're growing and strengthening in the inner man, because you're getting to know Jesus more and more. Because human nature, we want good places, comfort, convenience. Amen? That's what we want. And that's, yeah, that's okay. But when we follow and obey Jesus, there's going to be hardships, troubles, ad- adversities, trials, persecutions, name it, along the way. But it's an opportunity to see the greatness of God. And if you love Jesus and you want to be intimate, then trials and hardships are your Hawaii's. Amen? <laughs> You're sitting on a lawn chair at minus 40 in Winnipeg. And because, you know, this is God's perfect place, Pastor said, this is Hawaii. <laughs> Amen? God is greater than the perilous journey. It's a perilous journey, but God trumps them all. All the trials, all the, all the hardships, all the difficulties. So stop r and ring God. Resist and resent. Rest and relax in the presence of Jesus. Amen? Come on, why don't we have a praise break? Let's give God a clap and, a, and just praise God for his good. He works all things together for his good. You know, your pastor said that I can preach in 45 hours. So I, I, I thought it was 45 hours, 45 minutes. So, so I'll try to wrap this up as soon as possible. Third... God honors prayers of faith. I love Peter. Imagine without Peter's conversations with Jesus, we'll miss a lot of eternal immortal truths, right? We'll miss a lot of God's teachings. 
But because of Peter pushing the envelope all of the, all, most of the time, you know, Jesus responded and revealed truths that we ought, to, we ought to know. And so amongst the 12, Peter, instead of just praying survival prayers, he prayed a prayer that was bold and audacious. What did he say? Lord, if that's really you, tell me to come to you walking on water. And Jesus simply said, yes, come. So in the history of man, there's only two people who walked on water. And you're, 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 you're my, you're theologian. Like, are you sure there's just two? Yeah, because the Israelites, they didn't walk on water. They walked on dry ground in the Red Sea and River Jordan. But it's only Peter who was able to discover God's exceedingly abundantly. Hello? I was reading in my devotion in Ephesians chapter 6 that God has no favorites. But God will show him greater to those who will believe in him for the impossible. Hello? So the other 11 disciples, they were just like, oh, just Lord, help us to cross to the other side. Please help us, Lord. Save us, Lord. Ah!" And then Peter said, you bunch of CCs. I want to be part of Peter's Bible study. Because that would be a Bible study with bold, audacious prayers. Prayers for the impossible. Are you, are you, are you hearing me? And so, Lord, ah, please cause me to walk on water. And what's amazing about this story is that Jesus did not count the, the, the water for Jesus to walk on. Some of us will obey, Lord, if you'll only increase my salary, I know it's a sign from heaven that I will obey you. Increase my salary from 40 per hour to 40 per minute. That's miraculous, Jesus. I will obey. And then nothing happens on our favor. What happens is all against us. Amen? And we complain and we resent and we resist. Don't ask for the impossible in a time of crisis because God is up for the task. Peter walked on water while the storm was raging. You might be saying, well, he almost drowned. He doubted. Yeah, but he doubted on water, not in the boat. It's a different context. And he experienced Jesus saving him immediately when he said, Lord, save me. He had more experiences Of the miraculous, the greatness of Jesus than the other 11 just trying to survive. Are are you hearing this? Huh? Are 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 you in for some more? If you go further in the New Testament, what did Paul say? That God in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly all the lees on that uh, verse exceedingly abundantly you hear those words it's not oh yeah god is able to help you survive just make it through the day and hopefully you can make it to the next day (laughs) and god willing the next week oh god is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think or imagine. <sighs> That's the kind of God I have. Amen. And you might be saying, not just yours, me too. Amen. Amen. He's yours too. And you will see him front row seat if you obey, no matter what. If you follow, no matter what. And if you ask audacious, bold prayers, even in the midst of, of the greatest storms of your life. You have a wayward, wayward child? Don't just pray, Lord, save my son, my prodigal. Oh, have mercy, Lord, mercy me. Oh, you even sing the song, my mercy me. <laughs> you're begging, you're asking, you're pleading. When at that opportunity God gives you, he wants you to pray bold prayer. Lord, don't just save him, make him a pastor. Make him a pastor amongst the gangs of Winnipeg, amongst the gangsters of Winnipeg. Lord, make him a pastor, of, you know, as a, as a missionary to the First Nations. Lord, use him mightily to win many Canadians to Christ and disciples raised and leaders mentored and released. Lord, don't just save my son, make him a great man of God. 
and you have a, a wayward husband, you know, not kids, not just kids, husbands can be wayward. Amen. Wife said, Amen. Yeah, I know. Don't look at your husband right now. <laughs> Or you can pray, you, you have a, sh- a wife that shops till she drops. You can pray, you can pray. <laughs> Lord, close the mall, said Terrace BC. <laughs> Amen. I, thank God you have less malls here than in Winnipeg. In malls, you know, the devil is built, in the Winnipeg, the devil is building malls like crazy. I heard somebody said the Mall of America was built by Satan. And don't just pray, Lord, please help my wife stop. You know, Lord, let cause her to stop shopping. No, don't pray so prayers. She will not stop until she drops. Pray this kind of prayers. Lord, make my wife generous. Use her mightily to touch many lives by giving, by generosity. And your husband, oh, Lord, don't just change him. Don't just save him. Lord, make my man a mighty man of God. The leader of our men's fellowship, not just a church, but in the whole of Terrace, BC. Lord, use him greatly. Use him mightily. And how did you know that that works? Well, my mom prayed for me to be saved. I was the black sheep of the family. I was raised up by a Filipino mafia. And from the age of 18 to 19, my mom would come to my room at 5 a.m. in the morning because that's the time I went home. After I, you know, I went home drunk like a skunk. And she would come to that bedroom of mine and lay hands and, and pray for me. Or I don't know what she was saying. Or I, 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 I said tongues or I don't know. But she, she just kept praying and kept praying. And uh, I got saved. I got filled with the Spirit. And after three years, I became a pastor. Three years in the Lord, I became a pastor. And so on my first preaching, he didn't, she didn't know I was, I was preaching. She, she gave a testimony. She said, I, pray for, I prayed for gold and God gave me a diamond. I just prayed for my son to be saved and, you know, just to be used by God. And, and now he's a pastor of our church. He's one of the pastors. Because you know what? God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly. Don't just try to survive. You got a great God. Pray bold, great prayers. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because God is up to the task. He can do all things. Of course, according to his will. And the next, I will conclude, after they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. Some said, oh, I will stop here. I'll just stay and camp in the middle of the lake. No, don't stay there. That's not your destination. Thank God for getting to know Jesus there. But Jesus said very clearly, we are to cross to the other side. You are to cross to the other side because on the other side, you will not just see my greatness for your own consumption. You will see my greatness through you. You will... I will use you. You will be with me. And you will see how you and I will make a difference in the lives of other people. Amen? It says here, they landed as spoken and said by Jesus. And when the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area. And soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. And they begged him to let the sick, let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe. And all who touch him were healed. Where were, this, where were the disciples? They were right there where Jesus is. Well, he was healing, delivering, and touching lives. Amen? You know what? There can be no better life than this life. And I wonder why we resist and we resent when Jesus, as a gentle shepherd, leads us to a journey and an adventure with him. We're scared. We want to be in control. We don't want inconveniences. We don't want to be, you know, uh, you know, just not sure about things. But let me tell you, when you're in the middle of the storm, what comes out? Your fear? What else? Struggles, weaknesses, right? Negative things come out. So what? We all have those things. We look good on Sunday morning, Right? But when somebody cuts you while you're driving out of the church, you, you give them the finger. Not just the one finger, all fingers. I'm a Christian, I'll give you four. I don't know if you guys cut here while you're driving because in Winnipeg we do a lot of those things. Especially if it's a Filipino driver. Oh my goodness. Filipino drivers are worse. We come from a lawless driving lifestyle. 
And so if you see somebody in terrorist cutting you while you're driving, it could be a Filipino. <laughs> Beware. Are, are you with me? You know, like we're, we're, we're fighting against what God wants to do. He's leading us and guiding us. And yes, there are going to be trials and troubles along the way. And it will bring into the surface negative things that are on the inside of us. Can I be honest with you? I struggled with that for so many years. But who cares now? All I have on the inside, apart from Jesus, are negative stuff. Evil stuff. Hello? And if he wants to bring it to the surface so that I can repent, and so I can lean, lean. I said, when is it going to stop? I'm about to fall. Lean. So instead of leaning on my own understanding and strength, I would lean on Jesus. And when you lean on Jesus, you will discover his everlasting almighty arms. Amen? Amen. So anybody here, you want to live a life of obedience, following Jesus no matter what. Raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. All hands are raised. Amen. Praise God. Those who have not raised up their hands, you will be locked up in this building. (laughs) I'll tell Rob to close it while you're in the washroom. And padlock the whole building. I'm just kidding. If you raise up your hand, can you please stand up? I cannot pray for all of you. Okay? Now, some of you are standing up so that, oh, they might see me not standing up. And I'll just stand up too. (laughs) No, I think you all love to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen? And I'll be praying for you that you will be obedient. That you will be faithful. And that you will be praying bold, audacious prayers. Not just survival prayers. Your God is not just a God of survival or surviving. Your God is a God of exceedingly abundantly. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh my, I love it. I love this. Man, oh my goodness. God is an awesome God. Are you ready for the prayer? Yeah. Amen. Are you ready? Raise up your two hands. Okay. And we're going to pray. Okay. Let go of the control. Let go of everything. And we're going to pray. We're going to lean on Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you that you are the leader of our lives. You are the Lord of our lives. Jesus, you are king. You are master. And we're going to follow you. We are making a decision. We're not asking you to help us obey. You know, we are telling you we want to live a life of obedience. We choose to live a life of following you and serving you and walking hand in hand with you, Lord. And that's our choice. That's our decision today. But Lord God, I trust that along the way, we will see your greatness. Not just see it, but we will share your greatness to as many people as possible. Now touch every person, every inner man, every inner spirit here. Any, every person here right now who heard this message, cause them to grow, be transformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you glory and we give you honor and we are excited with this adventure with you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, we, amen and yes. Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you.